books. Um, you'll know that I sometimes dabble in history. I write about the history of the people who developed cosmology and the history of the people who were involved in Fermat's last theorem. Um, but I'm not a real historian. Um, what we have this afternoon is, is the genuine thing, a, a woman who really appreciates scholarship and who's covered a wide range of subjects. If you were at the panel session the other day about biography, um, you'll, have, you'll have heard her speak already. Um, she's written biographies of, uh, of Elizabeth Gaskell and William Hogarth. Um, and today she's going to tell a story about a group of men um, who quite literally changed the world. That, that phrase is often overused, uh, but it really is the truth in this context. Um, so we're going to hear about the lunar, the lunar men, uh, the men involved in the Lunar Society, and I'd like you to welcome to the, to the uh, stand uh, Jenny Uglo. Jenny. Hello. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, good. Um, well, it is really uh, lovely for me to be here uh, in Jaipur, such an amazing uh, festival. And yesterday, I was um, asked just out of the blue, oh, good. Um, somebody said, uh, what has struck you most about India? And of course, there are so many, many things. And I heard myself saying, um, the friendliness, um, that you have all been so welcoming and so friendly. So thank you. Um, but it's very good for me too, because what I'm talking about tonight uh, is friendship. Uh, it's a story of a group of men who met when they were young and they were friends all their life. And because they were friends, because they exchanged their knowledge and they worked together, and they knew their families, and they, they grew up all together, they grew old together. Uh, it was because of that that they could do the amazing things which they did. Um, also, um, I'm going to be talking about the, a group who lived in the very center of, of England, in, uh, in and around Birmingham. Um, and you would think that was so, so different to Jaipur. Um, it was 200 years ago, but yet there is such a lot that has reminded me um, of why I was so interested, because they come from a city of makers, and Jaipur is a city of makers, um, and you will see that they worked in metal, um, and they worked in, uh, with minerals, with jewels. Um, there was also Josiah Wedgwood, who was a great potter, um, and it was there um, that they, some of them who came from that background, that artisan background of making, uh, worked together with the people who had the knowledge and the new technological knowledge and the uh, inspiration to sort of take them uh, into uh, a new world. Um, I've got a PowerPoint, um, <laughs> and uh, I am not the best person at technology, so if, if I keep flicking backwards and forwards, uh, you have to um, uh, forgive me. But, is that the first one? One? Oh, there we go. Um, and uh, so I'm beginning with this picture of the moon because they are called the lunar men. Now, when you look at this, can you see, do you think it looks like a photograph of the moon? Yeah, it's extraordinary. And it just shows the skill uh, of the people I'm talking about because this drawing of the face of the moon uh, was actually done by a man looking through a telescope uh, as we might do now at the moon and then drawing in pastels, drawing in chalk. So it's exactly this mixture of science and art um, and that, too, is something that I find in Jaipur um, that comes together in this lunar group. So it's science, it's a new telescope, um, and it's art, uh, the artist doing the drawing. But it's also still mysterious, it's still coming out of a darkness. It's a, a new knowledge that uh, people want to explore. The first time that, that this kind of drawing had happened, and this is happening, that's at 1795, but the people meet in 1760, which would be about uh, 40 years, 30, 40 years 
uh, before all the amazing astronomical work is happening here at Jawamantal. And that too is a mixture, just the name of the machine, Jawa and Manta Mantra, the mystery. It's the machine and the mystery coming together. Um, so if I introduce you to these people, uh, this is just to start. This is a small group. And of course, they're all very British portraits. They're all middle-aged men in wigs, yeah? <laughs> um, but you have to think of them uh, before they were grand and good, before they had their wigs, when they're young men. Um, and, and Erasmus Darwin, the first one here, he was the grandfather of Charles Darwin. And he's an extraordinary man, a larger than life in, in many ways. He's about 20 stone, huge man, so big that he had a, a circle cut in his dining room table so that he could eat comfortably. <laughs> and he's big in other ways. He was a famous poet, uh, but he was also an inventor. He invented a thing which he, with great excitement, which he called the fiery chariot, uh, which was using steam to propel a... Uh, what was effectively a car. Um, and he thought of ways of making a car that people didn't pick up for 200 years. Uh, he was a doctor who looked after the poor in the, in the town that he lived, of Litchfield. Um, and he was also a thinker, and this is his connection with Charles, in that he's the first person in Britain to put forward, it's a slightly different, but, but to put forward a theory of evolution, which is very, very shocking at the time, uh, because we have a church who told you that the earth was founded, you know, created 4,000 years ago and that you must just believe exactly what uh, the, the teachings of the church said. And so evolution was very startling. Um, and he was, in, he was educated at the university. He went to Edinburgh University. So this is where the difference and exchange comes. Matthew Bolton, who was next to him, um, was very different. He left school. He was a, a metal worker from a metal working family workshop in Birmingham. Uh, generations of the family with the forge and the metal work. And he left school at 14, but he was full of ambition. He wanted to transform the small metal working of Birmingham into something which you could export across the world. Um, and so when he met by chance, Erasmus Darwin, he thought, ah, you have got the theoretical knowledge that will help me to understand heat and technology and fire and also organization. Also, and people in business will know this is important, Erasmus Darwin, uh, well off, he had the contacts so that he could help Bolton's business grow by introducing him to other people and selling it further. But then when Bolton he had the, uh, he, his business did grow, um, and he started the first uh, factory. He moved from the workshop into one big building where he put many workshops together. So it wasn't a factory like we know now, but it was a big organization. And to run his, his wheels, his turbines, he had a water wheel, um, and when the mill pond went dry in the summer, I'm sure this, he wanted power to uh, pump the water up. And somebody told him that up north in Scotland was this young man uh, who was working on improving the very rudimentary steam engine. And that young man was James Watt, who you now see as a very old man in the corner. Um, and so uh, Bolton got James Watt to come to Birmingham. Uh, Erasmus Darwin befriended him. Um, and this is the other thing, it wasn't, wasn't just exchanging knowledge, but personalities. If you work with people in your business or in your school, you'll know, you know how you have to deal with people too. So you have Erasmus bursting with ideas, Bolton, very ambitious, very practical, very bouncy, very optimistic. James Watt, and you can see that there, rather a worrier. You know, he, he, he had migraines, he worried. So it was Bolton's optimism that kept James Watt working for years and years on improving the steam engine, uh, which he did by seeing that if you cooled the water separately, rather than in the same letting a container go cold, hot, cold, hot, waiting for it, 
you would save about a third of the amount of coal that all the people who were using, trying to use steam engines for pumping the mines would do. So, and if you save a third of your fuel costs, talking to industrialists or whatever, you are saving a lot and you're making money. So when they patented that steam engine, Bolton's uh, metalworks grew into this first big factory for producing steam engines. Uh, and then later that went into the textile mills. And this is why they say they, they sort of kick-started the Industrial Revolution. And, and with them here is a fourth friend, Josiah Wedgwood, whose name I'm sure you know, who was a potter, lived just up the road. Um, Josiah, too, came from many generations of the same family, and his potters. And I've talked to, to potters here, um, and uh, they have the same problem. I think we still all still do that Josiah had which was, first of all, getting the heat in the kiln right, because you can lose 70% of all your pots. Just You've been working for days, for weeks, you put them in the fire, poof, they go. So it's learning about heat and how to control heat and glazes. And also, as I said, they are in the middle of England, right in the middle. So to sell his pots abroad, he had to take them over terrible roads, bump, 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 bump. And by the time they got to the ports at Chester, about at least a third, maybe two thirds were broken. So he learned, he, he watched Bolton build his factory and thought, I will do exactly the same, but how do we transport our goods, our metal, our things like that? Um, and then he got them all to work together on building canals. And of course, that's another great a mover in Britain of the Industrial Revolution is actually the transport system, the whole infrastructure. So already you see this, this group of four friends by exchanging ideas um, are, are beginning to transform uh, the making from craft making uh, into industrial making that can be transported and exported. We know Wedgwood uh, pottery, and it's pottery, not porcelain, is exported across the world. Um, and this is to show you how, they, how the factories grew. Um, if you think of Bolton starting a little family workshop, um, it, he, very soon he built a factory which he wanted to look grand, so it looks like a grand British mansion that a lord would live in, that you roll up to in your carriage. And inside are all the workshops. And just uh, on the far side, you can see the pond, the mill pond, which he makes look like a glorious uh, lake. Um, and here is uh, the steam engine that Bolton and Watt eventually uh, designed. This one was for a textile mill. Um, but I put it here just to show you, uh, just like the drawing of the moon, how beautiful their technical drawings were. Very accurate, but also very elegant, very beautiful, because what they're doing is science and selling, but it's also art. And they were very proud of the things that they made, um, which they felt were works of art, as well as products that they could sell. Um, and here we have the kind of products that Bolton's making in his metal works, mother of pearl buttons, silver dishes, patterns for swords and shoe buckles. In those days, all the uh, grand men in England had buckled shoes. And here are Etruria, which is what uh, Josiah Wedgwood called his factory. It was Erasmus Darwin's idea about the Etruscans and the fine wear. Uh, creamware, he was the first to put prints uh, on, on the pottery so that suddenly all the households of England who had had plain brown pottery had this wonderful printed, colorful stuff. Um, and then the very famous Jasperware with the classical models. But that's what he's really known about uh, today. So, so they've got together, um, but also that what was happening was that they wanted other people's uh, uh, input. So another friend came who was a very fine mathematician who could uh, t turn their experiments in, on heat, say, into mathematical terms. Uh, a botanist came, um, another doctor came, uh, a chemist who set up the first soap-making factory, James Keir. 
and he was a very sort of solid man. So when things went wrong, everybody relied on him. And they met, they met um, uh, every month. They all met together from their different places, uh, probably mostly in Birmingham. But they met at the time of the full moon because there were no street lights uh, in England. Um, and their meetings went on late into the night. And if you had the full moon, I don't know if it was the same here, that's when all the concerts, all the plays, all the parties took place at the time of the full moon. So they called themselves the Lunar Society. Now, I think that actually there were lunar societies all over Britain, societies who met to sing, who met to collect plants, who met to read. Uh, but we remember this one as the lunar society because the people were so much larger than life and achieved so much. Um, and they... The Joseph Wright of Derby, the artist who painted this picture, was a friend, a close friend of the group. Um, and he painted this picture at the same time just to show how um, exciting science is, it was to ordinary people, but also that it was a sociable thing. It's not a thing for specialists in laboratories. It's a thing for small groups of people working together. Um, this is a lecture where uh, the... Um, the, the orrery, which shows the movement of the planets, uh, is operated by a lamp that looks like the sun, so that you can see how they move. But if you see here, um, there is a, a Erasmus Darwin, there's the philosopher, but there are also younger people, there are also children in that. And it's very serene, it's very harmonious, it's saying we're reaching knowledge about the harmonious workings of the universe, it's sort of Newtonian physics. This is all balance and maths. But on the other side, uh, Wright also painted a picture which shows a different philosopher uh, giving a talk about an experiment in an air pump. And whereas the first picture is beautiful and harmonious, this one is really quite frightening because the bird, the white dove, it, you can just see at the top, is in a glass bowl and as they operate the pump all the air would go and they would see the bird begin to flutter 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 gasp um, to show how much the, the animals needed air in order to live they extract the air and then they would let the air back in but often i think the birds died often the mice died in their experiments too and so here, you see the children here, and there are women, and instead of everybody thinking this is beautiful and harmonious, they're frightened. They're, the children are frightened. They have to be comforted. So there's a sense that when you are working together on these great scientific mysteries, heat, light, the workings of the universe, you're also playing with huge forces, huge mysterious forces, and you can take it too far, do... It would seem little to begin a factory, but once you start this kind of experiment, are you experimenting with life uh, and death? Um, and this is the landscape near where they live. This is Derbyshire, and they're a few miles from where they were working, um, and a cave going down into the center of the earth. <clears throat> and it's a bit like that last picture in that if they wanted to understand how to make things work, they had to understand the minerals, they had to understand, uh, uh, and they had to look for materials. They're looking for materials for pottery, for quartz, for fluorite, and things like that, and also materials to seal their steam engines and so on. And so they went out into this, um, and it's just uh, rather similar to the way that you find the minerals in the Aravali Hills, um, so they went out looking, and uh, Erasmus Darwin wrote back, he went on one trip, and he said to his friends, I have spent two days uh, in the bowels of Mother Earth. So it's very poetic language. Um, and I have seen the goddess of nature naked in her divinity. And I have found such minerals that I will make experiments uh, which will be food for fire engines. So he told Bolton, and he told Watt, and he told, and they used these minerals. But Bolton, uh, who had an eye for a good thing, 
when when Darwin had gone down into these caves, they found one particular mineral, which is this, which is this beautiful fluorite from Derbyshire, Blue John. And instead of fire engines, this time Bolton made these wonderful ewers. So he's using, you know, they can use it all in different ways. Um, but the other thing was, as Darwin went down into the cave, because it's limestone cave, chalk cave, um, it, and he was, you know, remember he's that great big fat man. <laughs> so he's squeezing down into the cave, and he felt with his hands on the top of the cave, the roof of the cave, the walls of the cave, and everywhere he felt, um, he felt shells, fossils, cause, and, uh, and indeed chalk is made up of, of shells from beneath the sea. And then he began to think, not about steam engines or anything, but about how the earth was made. Um, and he came back and he realized that this had been, if it was shells, that all these great man hills had been deep underwater at some time. And he came back and he put a motto on his carriage, which said, E conscious omnia, everything from shells. And this was horrifying. He lived in a cathedral town and the... the um, a bishop in the cathedral and the religious people were horrified. Um, but he then said, this is the center of the earth. And he imagined that what if every living thing had grown from one single filament, had actually grown and developed over eons, over generations, adapting and modifying and so on, and, that that, and passing it on to posterity. So Darwin didn't just find the minerals or, like Bolton, make the money. He started to think about the center of the earth. Um, at the same time, uh, our artist Joseph Wright uh, was in Italy, in Naples, where there was a great explosion, uh, a great eruption um, uh, of Vesuvius. And he wrote home to this group of friends and he said, I am standing on the surface of the mountain. Uh, one of them was called Whitehurst, John Whitehurst, who had been examining a strata in the hills. And he said, if Whitehurst was here, his imagination would go, he used the same word, into the bowels of the earth, and he would tell a different story. And they realized that even their local landscape, landscape had been formed, as it were, by volcanoes and began drawing the strata and drawing what they thought was the inside of the earth. So everything they did took them further, took them into what we might call theor theor theoretical or experimental physics, as well as this practical side. Um, and this is John Whitehurst that Wright was talking about. And he was drawing, for the first, this is the first time in Britain, what, how he thought that valley, say, that I showed you where the minerals were coming from, how it had been formed by great crushings and collapsings uh, of the earth. Um, and here was Darwin's drawing of what he thought the center of the earth would be like. Um, now, I, uh, Darwin was a doctor, and um, this looks to me very like a sort of terrible medical drawing <laughs> of... Uh, of generation, of the uterus, of the womb, because the two things strangely come together. But he did imagine this hard layer of rock um, and then this molten layer within, um, and the volcanoes erupting sideways. And all this is very, very new knowledge, people only just beginning to write about it. Um, but also you see what, uh, how one thing leads to another. But if they're exchanging these ideas and writing to each other and doing these drawings, also, what fun they're having. Um, they were really enjoying what they did. Uh, and Darwin once thought he was going to miss a meeting and he, uh, because he had to go and deal with some children who had chicken pox. And he said, oh, what wit, you know, what wit, what rhetoric, what exchange I shall miss, what ideas bandied like a shuttlecock between you different uh, philosophers. And it's that thing of hitting ideas. The more you hit ideas, it applies to us all now, backwards and forwards, to people in different disciplines, the more uh, exciting it is, as well as the more wealth of knowledge. Um, now, there were, they had younger uh, people who came uh, to join them. This is Richard Lovell Edgeworth, who's 
uh, daughter Mariah was a famous novelist. He came from Ireland, and this is his friend Thomas Day. Uh, they brought a different philosophy. The others were rational, inquiring people, and they were followers of Rousseau. They believed in freedom, um, again, fighting against slavery, fighting for education, uh, and they sort of started trying to apply the lunar idea about constant experiment and thinking uh, to the social world as well, often, sometimes not very successfully. But all of them had this idea um, they were doing it for themselves, they loved it, but they were all idealists, they were all radical thinkers, uh, and they wanted to change society, and they really thought everything they would do would be for the better. And some of their ideas were quite sort of crazy, like uh, somebody once said, uh, rather than uh, the nations of the world destroying their sailors by making them fight unnecessary wars, what if we used all the navies to tow the icebergs from the North Pole to the equator, and then this would cool the tropics and ease the northern winters. Well, of course, we now live in absolute terror of exactly that happening, because that's a description of global warming. So I'm um, not to say that everything they thought uh, was altogether sensible. Um, but then uh, an even greater idealist arrived, and that was Joseph Priestley, who we know as the chemist, because he was the first person to isolate oxygen, which he called deflogisticated air, but Lavoisier called oxygen. Um, and he was a great chemist, but he was also a great Democrat. He was a, a leader of uh, uh, one of the non-conforming Protestant sects who do outside the Church of England. At that time, they were fighting for their rights. They were fighting for religious toleration. Um, and Priestley was therefore hated by the establishment. Um, and so when he's called Dr. Phlogiston, uh, uh, this is when it begins to seem to the general public that all these ideas of the lunar men were actually dangerous because here they saw priests standing on, on the Bible and setting fire to uh, traditional uh, knowledge and to the law and defying the law. Um, but everybody stood by him. They were all trying to say, calm down a bit, uh, Joseph, you know, you're going a bit far. Um, but all his lunar friends uh, stood by him. Um, and when the French Revolution came, uh, they, uh, it, people began making a connection between uh, the philosophers, because that's what they called themselves, experimental philosophers, and the philosophes, the thinkers who had been behind the uh, ideas of the French Revolution, and indeed they were quite connected. Um, and so then people turned, uh, turned against them, the local people turned against them. They found that it was indeed dangerous to take uh, the search for knowledge too far, rational inquiry, uh, thinking about the formation of the earth, thinking about all these things that were not accepted. Um, and uh, they all welcomed the French Revolution, and two years uh, after it began, there was a dinner to celebrate the storming of the Bastille, the beginning of what they thought was French freedom. Uh, and at that dinner, uh, threats were made against Priestley, and a great mob uh, was called by the authorities, we think, who set fire to his house, set fire to his library, destroyed his wonderful laboratory. And it was said that for half a mile around, uh, all the roads and lanes were scattered with papers. All his precious papers had gone. Um, but uh, he had always written uh, out of, for the general public, for us. He didn't believe in specialism, and nor did the others. So he called his books on electricity, on chemistry, on gases, histories, because he wanted us all to be able to experiment. And he showed how you could experiment in your own house. He, he, used the he gave diagrams of the kitchen equipment that you could use in order to find a gas and things like that. And everybody could do it. Um, because what he profoundly believed and what they all believed, and it's, it's something that is worth again thinking about today, uh, he said the progress of knowledge like the waves of the sea or the light from the sun doesn't go in one direction only, but in all directions at once. Uh, and uh, if we all learn to question, uh, we might hope under God that this progress will put an end to all oppression and 
prejudice. Well, it's a very idealistic hope, uh, but I think it's one that we can still cling to, that the more questions we ask, uh, the questions about the world, the questions about the things around us, the questions about authority, uh, will help in the end to get uh, rid of, of uh, progress. Um, so I've taken us back to the moon because I'm going to stop here. There are so many stories about all of them that I could tell. Uh, because just as they are getting old, most of them have died, a new generation are coming, a new generation, romantic poets, a new generation of scientists, Humphrey Davy, Faraday, and so on. Um, and science... I just, just to kind of summarize some of the things you were talking about, these, this group of men, this small group of men, this hub who met once a month, as you say, um, you know, they changed chemistry, they changed our understanding of, of biology and evolution, of how we understand the Earth, and then these very practical issues of, of uh, more productive engines, of, of, of greater power, of greater industrialization. And then I just wanted to just to remind people of the impact of that, you know, with that greater industrialization, we have changes in society, we have uh, fewer yeah. rural populations, more people moving to the cities. Yeah. I assume this affected the, the military industry as well, and, and empire. Yes. So this is a, a global does. impact, I, I'm guessing. Yes. Um, Yes, it's, it seems an enormous amount to claim for one small group. But they, um, and they, of course, were not alone, because as soon as people start working like that, they inspire other people in other cities, and they exchange knowledge. And, and because they became known, uh, experimental chemists came from Italy or from France to see them when they came to England. Priestley went to Paris and talked to Lavoisier about his experiments, and then Lavoisier went off and did other experiments, and then said, ah, oh, this is oxygen, you know? Um, so, so they're part of an of a, of a ever-growing network, but they did have a tremendous impact. Um, simply, the, uh, if, if, if you think about the canals, which is one part of their work, um, of course, it helped the industry, it helped the sale of goods, um, but it meant that food could be transported so much more cheaply, so that um, pe some people in different parts of Britain had been uh, almost on the edge of starvation, um, and the price of things like potatoes, which was a staple, and bread uh, went down. So that was the first uh, a small stage. And, and always they wanted to, Priestley with his oxygen, um, was again wanted to make things better and had this great idea that you could pump pure air uh, through hospitals or through schools. And things. He, he began to understand about pollution, but it's very funny. And, and he said, um, when he discovered it, he was so excited, he said, but up to now, only I and one mouse have, <laughs> have had it. And then he had uh, other ideas, like you would have um, like oxygen bars, like pubs, where you would go in and have a breath of this extraordinary, exhilarating air. Um, the real impact, of course, was the steam engine, uh, which then got taken up by um, the mills, the textile mills, but also the mines, pumping the mines, uh, getting material out. Um, and that, so they, they're developing it in the 1760s, they then get a patent, there's a huge boom uh, in the years after that. And so that James Watt can say to Bolton, um, the men of Manchester are steam mill mad. Everybody had to have their steam engine. That allowed for bigger factories. Um, and uh, that really does push you into the industrial and, revolution. And I suppose you can then start linking to India in terms of exporting of cotton by the, by the yes. Raj. It's only yes. possible because you have these giant factories in England yes. driven by pumps invented by these men in Birmingham. It's these extraordinary yes. global links. Yes, and you is. mentioned medicine then in hospitals. It, it just struck me that of all the areas they touched on, medicine was not really one of them, even though Erasmus Darwin was himself a doctor. Yes. Um, well, medicine, I want to go back a little and say about the early factories. We think of the Industrial Revolution, certainly in Britain, as a terrible time when big factories are built, people pour in from the countryside, they work for no money, they live in awful conditions, and laws have to be passed to make them better. But when they built the first factories, um, they were seen as model workplaces, uh, and they had schools, they had hospitals, they had dispensaries, and, and uh, people were actually amazingly glad to work in them, but they, that did change. But yes, medicine was an aspect of it. Um, 
the use of gases, um, the use of electricity. It was experimental medicine. Uh, one of the gases, of course, that they discovered was um, Humphrey Davy, who was a younger member of, uh, and the friend of the group, uh, was nitrous oxide, laughing gas. Um, but they took it, first of all, just simply to get high and get funny, and they didn't realize how wonderful it would be as an anesthetic. Uh, another one um, uh, that is a first that comes from the Lunar Society um, was the uh, introduction of... Um, uh, from the from the Fox Club, uh, the whole business of heart drugs and uh, digoxin as it, was, as it is now. So that was introduced, but again, that was experimental, and many people died uh, on the way, I'm afraid. So that the reading of the medical experiments is not is not always, especially Darwin. As soon as you gave him anything new, he'd try it, right, and then he'd write it down, and he goes terrible things like very interesting, uh, vomiting, convulsions. Uh, death. <laughs> not always, but not all experiments are good. Okay. Um, I'm going to come to questions very, very soon because I, I suspect we have lots of questions. We have such a large, enthusiastic audience. So um, people have microphones. I'm guessing there are volunteers with microphones. Um, actually, why don't we go to questions? There's a lady just there with her hand up, halfway down the back, and then uh, a gentleman just to your right as well. So we'll take those two questions first, and then we'll try and take as many other questions as possible. Um, thank you, ma'am. Um, this was not an age of internet or telephones. So how did these men get together in the first place? How did they get to know of each other? Yes. Thank you. Um, yes, you said this was not an age of internet communication. You couldn't, you know, find it. And it's very interesting because when the World Wide Web started, somebody, uh, an American commentator critic, said there has been no exchange like this since the days of the lunar men. Um, they got together. It, it's a selective process. It, it was partly luck. Um, so the first people who are getting together is this, this idea of the university-educated person, Darwin, and Bolton, the artisan who had... They'd all grown up going to lectures given by uh, people coming out from the Royal Society, like performances of magnetism or electricity, where you stood on a wax block and your hair stood on end and things like that. Um, uh, um, so, but once those two were together and they brought in somebody else, then people would hear about them. So then they get in touch with them, like Wedgwood hears about them, uh, the younger ones. Uh, Richard Lovell Edgeworth, who was fascinated by uh, magnetism, the working of magnetism, he knew that in Birmingham there was this group and he sought them out. And then they have another friend. Um, altogether, they, 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 and also they wrote, um, they, they, they were in touch with the Royal Society. Benjamin Franklin came from this area, he visited them. Um, uh, he had relations who were button makers in Birmingham. Um, and Franklin was connected with the Royal Society, so he took them to the Royal Society and things like he lent priestly great libraries of books. People started helping them. Uh, and, and so it just went like that. But also, for me working on them, um, at one point uh, they had uh, Bolton and Watt were putting steam engines into... Uh, tin mines and things in Cornwall in the far west of England, uh, far too far to get back every month. So they wrote each other long letters which would describe what they were doing and the experiments that they were doing and so on. Um, so they get together, it's a lucky accident, uh, it then builds and then more people hear about it. Communications, with, it is a long time ago, but communication is actually very good. Yeah. And, and you mentioned the Royal Society. I think the Royal Society almost pioneered the idea of a, an academic journal yes. where you could document yes. your experiment yes. and you could present it to the yes. world yes. for criticism. Then there was a gentleman just to the right. Hi. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, you mentioned briefly the priestly riots. What about the, the, the established church at large? What, did they have to fight against the established church in England with these scientific discoveries? Yes. Um, the... The, 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 the priestly riots <coughs> are both <coughs> are largely political because um, people fear that the 
ideas that have been given to the general public that they could question and so on um, will uh, foster a revolution in Britain as in France. The established church were certainly very much against the experiments that they were doing and the explanations that they were doing. Um, not only Darwin and evolution, which went against the whole creation story that was taught in the church, um, but the, the um, discoveries in geology, which are going to be the great thing of the next generation, the 1840s, which showed the age of the earth was millions of years before what was said in the Bible and what was said by the church. Um, and um, indeed, the canon of Litchfield, which was the place that Erasmus Darwin lived, uh, openly condemned him, um, and they wouldn't have anything to do with it. But it then becomes a complicated thing, because if you're a... Wedgwood was a dissenter too, like Priestley, very straightforward. But if you want to sell to all the grand people uh, who go to church or who wish to be respectable, um, you keep quiet. So Bolton, uh, Bolton wouldn't have anything to do with Leeds. He just said there are too many isms, can't be bothered with isms, uh, ideas and things like that. Let's just get on and sell the goods. You know, so they're all different. But the established church did not like them. Thank you. Um, there's a gentleman just here. Is there anybody way at the back? Before I don't want to miss people out at the back. Okay, there's somebody <laughs> over there next. And there's somebody Hello. way Hello. over the back, right yeah, at the way back. Uh, nitrous oxide is, can be observed by humans. Can't hear. Why, why not other gases were uh, first uh, uh, were experimented with the, with the people? Why only nitrous oxide? I can't hear. Uh, could, you, could you repeat the question again, sorry? Yeah, uh, nitrous oxide, which is a, a laughing gas, was observed by people. Why not sulfur dioxide or other gases, which can be produced easily? Oh. Why only nitrous oxide by the scientist? Yes. I don't know. Um, it's about. Uh, I, it was, I think it was about the production of nitrous oxide. Yeah. And yeah. why did that become? Why did they? Why were they so enamoured with nitrous oxide? Yes. Yeah. Um, the the um, nitrous oxide is interesting, and in that that um, <coughs> the one of the people who younger people who joined the uh, Lunar Society group started a clinic in Bristol um, which wanted to use uh, gases to relieve um, tuberculosis. TB was a great consumption, a great problem in Britain. Um, and so uh, they thought that by, the, the, a whole, by breathing a whole set of different gases, uh, you would um, get better. It would be, be like going to a better climate, would actually improve uh, the lungs. And it was called uh, the Institute of Pneumatic Medicine. Um, and Humphrey Davy came there as a young apprentice. Um, he was found by, became friends with the son of Josiah Wedgwood. Again, it's networks. Um, and then he was working on nitrous oxide. Um, when they all took it, this is where science has said it, it, like they're called meets poetry, meets art. Um, a great friend of that younger generation uh, was Coleridge, um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, uh, and so the poets also interested. But they were young, sorry, this is on, and so when they found that nitrous oxide, they took it and they became immensely exhilarated and they laughed and they just ran around the room and they, it was wonderful. Um, uh, one of the poets, as it were, Rosalvi wrote to Coleridge and said, um, Davy has found this wonderful gas. Uh, it's like being in heaven. You must come at once. And so it got a bad reputation uh, as just like a party drug. Yeah? Um, and, it, and it took a long time. And, and, it was, and then Davy, who wanted to be a respectable man in London, uh, forgot it. So they sort of forgot it till people went back and worked on it and realized its wonderful anaesthetic uh, effects. It, it, um, it, it just got, a, got used for the wrong reason and it became uh, uh, forgotten. In, in London now, it's very popular again. Oh. If, you go to, if you go to East London um, and you walk around the streets in the morning, you find these little um, capsules, about yeah. silver capsules, which, are, which were full of nitrous oxide the night before. Yeah. And people are taking them at parties and, and clubs and throwing them away. So you find these nitrous oxide 
uh, uh, it's very capsules, exhilarating. They don't seem to have suffered terrible hangovers or no, anything. It's, they it's, just it's, <laughs> it's a good thing. Somebody have. way at the back. Okay, who has, who's got it at the back? Okay, we'll take. I, I wish to make an appreciative comment and to highlight certain ideas oh. which I think extremely significant. The first thing is uh, the, the nomenclature of lunar society. Uh, think of uh, Luna, Luna, and lunatic. Yes. Now, it is uh, the other side of it is that Luna has to do with imagination. Yes. And imagination is the source of the possibilities of infinite ideas. Yes. And it is from those ideas that things move further. Secondly, the kind of extrapolation of ideas belonging to different aspects of knowledge. I mean, this is to be understood because normally what we think is that this is science, this is humanities, this is geology, this is mathematics, and they have nothing to do with each other. I think uh, what we have heard shows that these things cannot, should not be seen as uh, apart from each other. That is the second thing. And the third thing I wish to uh, say, highlight is, uh, you see, knowledge is something which grows in a yeah. collective uh, atmosphere. It, it, it cannot be, it doesn't grow, it doesn't develop by a single person. I mean, yeah. this particular example that you have talked to us about shows how people from different uh, say areas come together and you see the friendship, the idea of friendship with which you begin, I mean something is extremely important. Okay. The give and so, take of ideas. So, could uh, you, uh, if the acoustics at this end oh, are not I great. I, I don't know. Could you catch that question? Well, I, I think it, it, it just shows the, the way the question is phrased, that how complicated it can be in terms of ideas and uh, history. But, uh, one thing that I took from that was that um, if we're using images like the moon, when it's a practical image that they did actually meet because the moon gave them light, um, uh, it's also a realm of the imagination. And if they didn't have the imagination, they wouldn't have made the practical advances that they did. And this is very true. Um, and when I said Darwin was a poet, I meant that in the, a literal sense. He was a best-selling poet. And, and he um, then did this thing, which, which is quite hard to do today, which is to put the scientific knowledge they had into actual best-selling poetry um, uh, so that people could do things. And it, it explained things like the tides, how the seeds uh, can circulate the world and the rumbling of the mills and the so on, so that um, the imagination and the practical did come together. But, but I think the great thing as well as exchange. One thing is friendship, support, exchange of ideas. Um, uh, and the other thing is simply uh, courage, sim that sort of imagination. So that instead of saying, oh, we can't do this, you always just say, why not? You know, why not uh, think this way? Or why not tow the icebergs to the middle of the world? Or why not? So um, it's a imagination practicality and a kind of imaginative courage too that takes you beyond what you would expect. And, and the gentleman was talking about the, the, the breaking down of barriers between mathematics and yes. science and engineering yes. and industry and, and also breaking down of barriers between class. Yes. You know, these, these men came from different areas but there was no barriers they could meet together over dinner. They, they did. They ideas. actually said um, because uh, Nobody was very conservative, but they had different ideas of politics. And Priestley actually said, well, we leave our politics aside. When we enter this room, we forget our politics. We're working on this, uh, uh, on this same thing. Um, and so breaking down that kind of barrier um, was, all, was, yes, also uh, right. very important. And, and this was a particularly uh, exciting time. And I think the internet might have given it back to us in a way, up to a point, um, when um, 
we didn't have specialisms in science. So if you were like experimenting in chemistry, you could write out your experiment. And somebody who could read, who was interested, who had a glass jar and a bowl of water and a flame, could have a go themselves. Um, similarly with physics, although the mathematics is there, um, you, could, you could explain, and ex it was explained, as you said, in the Royal Society Journal or the Gentleman's Magazine, or people were interested. They could explain. And what happens in the next generation is that the more you learn, the more specialized it becomes. It goes into institutions, it goes into laboratories, it goes into universities, and, and we think we can't understand it. You know, we just can't understand it anymore. It becomes a different language. I'm just determined to get my one question at the back, at least. So. Uh. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, there is one theory uh, which says that Shivkar Bapuji Talpade, he constructed India's first unmanned uh, aeroplane. So, what are your views on this? Second, uh, how much Vedic science contributed to science? Uh, if you can throw some light on it. Thank you. Oh, I don't think I can. <laughs> but the, um, if people I, 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 I simply think that invention in any culture demands that kind of uh, vision and that kind of leap. I don't know what happened when he constructed India's first unmanned aeroplane, what the uh, reception was, or whether, whether people feel even with that that you're breaking some laws of, of uh, reality or that you're taking it onto some plane which actually can lead to aggression rather than... Uh, peaceful development. Can you? Don't look at me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, don't, I, I don't know anything about this, except that I, I mentioned it briefly when I spoke yesterday, that um, you were saying these people left their politics at the door. Yes. And, and I think in India at the moment, there are some politicians who are trying to use science for political ends. Right. And some um, yes. are, you know, Indian science is, is respected around the world. And it has been for literally, literally thousands of yes. years in Indian mathematics as Absolutely. well. So it doesn't need this extra um, bias, you know, bringing brought in by, by people with political ends. So, um, you know, I, I think there's enough, India has enough to be proud of already without having to, to manufacture ideas. I'm yeah. going to ask one last question before we finish. Oh, I, 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 what I will say. Sure. Is, so, <laughs> so, 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 I'm going to say, I've, got, I, I've been given the wind up, I'm afraid. Je so, before I ask my question, I will say Jenny will be signing books over at the sinus, uh, the author's tent, which is the, the, the block with the blue bar, which I'm pointing at over there. Um, I'll be over there if you want to challenge me or ask me any questions as well. But my one last question was going to be, it's the lunar men. Yes. And we heard lots of yes. men. And I think yes. Maria yes. Edgewood was the only woman that was yes. mentioned who was a poet. Were there any women involved in, in this yes. adventure? The, 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 the group who got together were indeed men. Um, but, the, and the, but the women in their families and the children, they had the children experimented too, um, did come to the uh, meetings. Um, and they tend, there are, there are some very brilliant women scientists just coming up. And things like, uh, Erasmus Darwin wrote a, an extraordinary book called The Botanic Garden, a long poem, which was, he was a, a very fine botanist. Um, and the poetry goes along the top of the page. The second half is all the notes of the people who've sent him ideas. Um, and about half of those are women. And they're women doing... It, uh, botany has been obviously we've often been to do with women because you can do it in the home, you do it in the garden. But they're doing very elaborate experiments like uh, dissecting bulbs and seeing how they grow and grafting and things. And, and they... They were the ones that provide the knowledge that the men uh, worked on. So the women are there. And then we're going to come to people like Mary Somerville, a mathematician, and, and uh, uh, Ada Herschel Lovelace. And and, yeah, and so on. yeah really, exactly. We, we did start five minutes late, so we do have time for one more question. And there was a man here who launched into the sky a second ago. <laughs> so if we can just get to the microphone, we'll take one last question, hopefully a brief oh. question. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, change is a constant in life, and uh, things are... And that's part of creation. Yes. And there'll always be people in, in, in the world that will be working on the frontiers of knowledge to change, yes. right? Uh, there are a bunch of people who work, you know, for the positive change. And we live in a bipolar world, and there are a number of people who work on the negative change. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, those guys who are working on the negative change need to be slowed down, and the ones who are working on positive change need to be accelerated. So what role can journalists play to bring this kind of thinking mm -hmm. to the table 
to encourage this kind of movement forward? Well, as a journalist, I think um, what kind of role? Um, I hope that journalists w would actually make that distinction between uh, positive change and negative change and be able to note. I don't want to have a uh, whole set of warning journalism, uh, rather like the politicization. You know, if you move forward, this may happen, that may happen, and so on. Um, but, but I think that it, it's very hard, and it was very hard for the lunar men always to tell the consequences of what they were discovering. Um, and uh, I think that journal, the role of journalists is simply to keep us informed and not always to invent some uh, grand set of, of, of consequences because that is to do with experiment, is trying, uh, inquir perpetual inquiry, encourage inquiry, report inquiry, um, and to leave it open. I mean, Priestley said, we, uh, I'm, we're, I'm standing on the shore of a great sea, you know, I can't see the horizon. So if journalists en uh, encourage that exploration um, and, res and report responsibly with, uh, without it laden with uh, politi political ideas or alarmist ideas or over-optimistic ideas, but report responsibly, then I think we can all get excited again. I, I think the problem with journalism, and I, I come from a journalistic background, is yeah. that the job of, say, a newspaper journalist is ultimately to sell newspapers. And that can mean being sensationalist, being uh, scaremongering, exaggerating, etc. And, and for a long time in England, this is very much the case in England, so I can't really speak so much for Indian journalism, but in England we always do say we need more science in yeah. the newspapers, we need more science. And actually I think we need less science. We, need, we don't need the scaremonger, we don't need the sensations, we need the science that actually does mean something significant. Um, and, and hopefully that way we can, we can uh, make people realise some of the great opportunities and some of the great... Uh, uh, yeah. worrying things that, that, that they have to look ahead to as well. Yeah. Um, we've run out of time, I'm afraid, so uh, please do join Jenny at the Writers' Tent afterwards, uh, but before that, please thank her for, for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give a huge thanks to Jenny Uglo and also to Simon Singh for facilitating. It begins to grasp the imagination of the mass of people, not just people like the lunar men, and they look to these lunar societies as the radicals that, uh, that thrilled them. Um, and Mary Shelley, if you think of those two Joseph Wright paintings of the harmony of the universe that we can explore and the terrors of the forces and the mystery of the moon, when she wrote Frankenstein, she had been, and so had Shelley, uh, to some of these lectures, the kind of lectures that talked about the things the lunar men were exploring. Um, and she wrote that the philosophers of old promised miracles but could do nothing. Uh, but the modern philosophers have indeed, she said, performed miracles. Um, they still know, they always said, we are only on the threshold of knowledge. And that's another thing that we must say. We don't know it all. We're on the threshold of knowledge. Um, but I hope I've shown you a bit of what she said. They penetrate into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places, beneath the earth of volcanoes, and also uh, the experiment of gases, of looking at the very, the very minute uh, through their microscopes, the very remote through their telescopes. Um, they ascend into the heavens. They have discovered how the blood circulates and the nature of the air we breathe. That's the... Uh, the bird in the air pump, and also Priestley's oxygen. Um, they have acquired new and almost unlimited powers. They can command the thunders of heaven. Now that's Benjamin Franklin and things, and the, and the lightning rods, and the, again, more about electricity and kites. Uh, mimic the earthquake, and even mock the invisible world with its own shadows. So Mary Shelley, who pre presented a very terrifying portrait of what science could do in the, in, in the uh, recreation of life um, uh, also points to this great mystery that all these artisans and makers, and they did become tycoons, uh, are also just in their ordinary lives and in their experiments working with the great powers uh, of nature um, and of the heavens. So that's why I leave you with the moon and thank you very much. Right. Thank you.